you've had a, um, a fuller version of the paper, uh, so all I'm going to try to do here is to uh, summarise uh, the main themes. I don't particularly want to get bogged down on the rather lengthy third section uh, dealing with conflict of rights, although I'm happy to answer questions about that if they come up in, in discussion. I want to try and cover the whole of the paper in outline. My starting point, as you'll have seen, if you've looked at the paper, is that the courts face an essential choice over to whether to recognise or to ignore uh, questions of, of, of conscience that come uh, before them. And in the paper I set out some of the reasons uh, for both recognising or ignoring, and then if they choose uh, to recognise, uh, three subsidiary uh, questions that arise. Uh, how uh, issues of statutory silence or indeed uh, uh, where uh, Parliament has considered the question but ruled against the claim in some sense, how those would be dealt with, uh, how the courts uh, should uh, approach uh, questions of conscience in the sense of should they be treated as uh, autonomous choices or are they in some other sense duties, and then thirdly this question of how uh, recognition may cut across uh, the uh, rights or freedoms services provided uh, to other people. So let me start off then with this question of uh, the choice that the courts face between recognising or not uh, in conscience questions. Just let me run through, as the paper does, some of the reasons why we might say the court should ignore uh, issues of conscience. And they're quite persuasive in a way. Uh, first of all, you could say, well, this actually uh, fits a kind of positivist understanding of law. We make a strict separation between law and morality. As Hart says in the concept of law, uh, determining the legality of a law is a question uh, from whether we're going to obey it uh, if it's against our conscience. Secondly, as, as Peter uh, said uh, this morning, uh, why should uh, the cost of a conscience claim effectively be reallocated? Why shouldn't it simply fall on the person whose conscience uh, they claim is infringed? Isn't that the right way to, uh, to go? In a certain sense as well, by ignoring our uh, conscience uh, matters, uh, the courts treat behaviour consistently. Uh, the same behaviour is treated in the same way regardless or, or uh, why uh, the person has behaved in the way they have. You see that particularly uh, in the discrimination cases that we're quite uh, familiar with. You could also argue that traditionally preparedness to suffer uh, for one's conscience has been seen as a mark of sincerity, uh, particularly in relation to uh, civil disobedience. Although I would say uh, with Julian uh, this morning uh, that conscientious objection is in a slightly different category uh, to uh, civil disobedience. It's not necessarily a public uh, act uh, where questions of sincerity arise in exactly the same kind of uh, way. Conversely, you could say, uh, as indeed Lady Hale in uh, 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 the Pretty uh, case uh, argues that there's a kind of duty of recipro reciprocity. Uh, that uh, uh, if you benefit from one set of anti-discrimination laws, you should be bound uh, by another. Isn't that part of the social uh, compact? So shouldn't the courts be blind? Shouldn't they be neutral uh, to, to these arguments of conscience uh, in, in consequence? Okay, but what are the arguments then for, for recognising? Well, I start from the position uh, that failure uh, to, uh, to recognise, in a sense, uh, 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 privatises, or to put it more strongly as some of the, uh, the critics do, trivialises uh, the, the nature of conscience claims. And so they become purely private matters. Uh, in a certain way, uh, the courts sometimes say, well, you can believe that, or in fact, you can even teach it in a religious community. But one thing you can't do is to act upon it. And of course, that causes a difficulty, doesn't it? Because on the one hand, the courts are saying, well, these are important beliefs. We think you're sincere. Uh, but they're not so important, you must be allowed to be able to act on them. There's a kind of dissonance, a contradiction there, felt particularly acutely uh, felt by people who are trying to integrate as those who make these conscience claims are, try and integrate their beliefs on the one hand and their behaviour on, on the other. 
many writers have made the, uh, the parallel uh, uh, between, between uh, 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 conscience and sexual identity and argue that this is a kind of form of closeting of uh, religious or other identities that's taking place. Even if it's not so blatant or obvious, I would nonetheless say that the way that the law sets up uh, some of these uh, questions, particularly in discrimination uh, context, uh, uh, has a kind of power to it uh, that ignores or, or, or downplays our conscience questions. So, for example, when, it, as a matter of discrimination law, we reduce uh, 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 a matter's employment or, or uh, serving someone to uh, simply a question of supply, we've taken a choice and we've embodied a choice in law that actually cuts off uh, uh, the, uh, the moral uh, questions that might be behind how I do my work. We've effectively ruled all of those to be impermissible. And that's quite a strong position to, uh, to take. On the other hand, I argue in the paper that uh, there's actually quite a lot legally to be said uh, for recognising uh, conscience claims. Certainly it's a matter of human rights uh, law. Uh, so we have a, 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 an interesting and important decision uh, in the uh, Flamenos uh, case, Flamenos against Greece, where uh, the, court, the Court of European Court of Human Rights turns the question on its head and says actually the failure uh, to recognise that some law breaking is motivated by conscience uh, is a category mistake. It's not to recognise that there is a difference uh, between this kind of law breaking and other uh, law breaking. In other words, it's irrelevant. Uh, equally, uh, we've got the uh, decision uh, uh, in the important uh, conscription uh, uh, case by the Grand Chamber of, uh, of the uh, court in, in a case from Armenia, the Beatayan uh, uh, case, uh, where the chamber said, and I quote, although individual interests must on occasion be subordinated to those of a group, democracy does not simply mean that the views of the majority must always prevail. A balance must be achieved which ensures the fair and proper treatment of people from minorities and avoids any abuse of the dominant position. Thus, respect on the part of the state towards beliefs of a minority religious group, like the applicants, he was Jehovah's Witness, uh, uh, by providing them uh, with the opportunity to serve society as dictated by their conscience, might, far from creating inequalities or discrimination as claimed by the government, rather uh, ensure cohesive and stable pluralism and promote religious harmony and tolerance in society. And finally, uh, third human rights argument, uh, we've got, of course, the employment cases uh, and the group of cases that went before the Court of Human Rights at uh, EWIDA and the UK, uh, where uh, the domestic approach of effectively ignoring uh, our conscience uh, our claims uh, was found to be incorrect, and the, uh, the court found that Article 9 was indeed engaged, although uh, could be balanced and outweighed uh, in uh, three out of four of, uh, of those cases anyway. So the paper argues for a recognition approach rather than ignoring. Now what about the subsidiary arguments? Uh, first of all this question of uh, statutory uh, silence. So are, is it somehow impermissible uh, to, uh, to raise conscience claims in court uh, when uh, there's no specific statutory exemption uh, uh, or indeed uh, when uh, Parliament has actually considered uh, the place for its exemption uh, but has decided against it. The amendment, let's say, uh, failed uh, during the parliamentary uh, process. That, incidentally, was the, was the case uh, with the marriage of Estras, uh, a question that finally uh, reached the courts in Liddell. There had been a campaign to provide for a separate exemption and it did fail uh, in, in, in Parliament. <coughs> Well, I argue uh, that uh, silence of this kind does not uh, uh, preclude a, a later uh, legal challenge uh, for several reasons. First of all, as in, as in the marriage of Strauss uh, uh, situation, uh, when you read the parliamentary debates, it may become apparent uh, that actually the possibility of a legal challenge was envisaged in those debates, and in fact was one of the reasons why an exception was not granted in the first place. 
Because you can go to the courts, you don't need a statutory exemption. Secondly, in any way, uh, since when did legislators uh, become the last word on what the meaning of constitutional rights is? Fairly obviously not. So uh, to argue that, that simply uh, because there, there's a law and it says this somehow precludes a uh, later challenge flies against our whole, whole practice. In fact, just to give you an example, take the Ashes Bakery case. The Northern Ireland Assembly has rejected four times uh, in, in successive years uh, our proposals for same-sex marriage. Does that make it impermissible uh, to bring a legal action of this kind? Of course it doesn't. Uh, any more than it will on the other side uh, 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 of the argument. And then, of course, we've got situations where the legislation in question simply doesn't really touch on, on the issues of conscience. Uh, you'd have to have a crystal ball uh, to know that the legislation somehow covered all of the field. This is actually one of the places, I think, where, where you see and I probably disagree. And we can perhaps explore that at a later place on exactly what the disagreement is. So I don't regard the, uh, the silence argument uh, as being in any way precluding. OK. Uh, secondly, then, uh, uh, right, OK. Second then, quickly, uh, 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 what about this, this question of, of uh, 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 how should the courts treat the nature of these claims? Uh, in the paper, uh, I argue that one of the problems uh, with uh, uh, how uh, uh, courts are often seen as dealing with these, these claims is that they don't adopt uh, what uh, Chris uh, 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 McCrudden calls uh, uh, an, in, an internal cognitive aspect. They don't put themselves uh, in the shoes of the, the people who are making uh, the claims and try to do the extra work to understand uh, what the claim means from their point of view. And uh, in the paper, I have a section which explains uh, that in the history of conscience, and this is not a recent phenomenon at all, in the history of conscience claims, indeed in the history of religious freedom, uh, you'll find it grounded repeatedly on the notion that what's involved is not rights or choices, but duties. One uh, 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 a Catholic uh, uh, writer puts it very pithily. Conscience has rights because it has duties. This is the whole basis uh, for, for the argument. Failing to recognise the extent to which uh, individuals face a choice between the duty of obeying the state and the duty of obeying their conscience uh, really uh, uh, underlies a number of the problems uh, that the, uh, the courts approach uh, these, these questions, I argue. And incidentally, that's not just a religious viewpoint. You find exactly the same perspective, for example, in the 19th century American writer Henry David Thoreau, who argues that uh, Congress doesn't settle my moral duties when it makes laws. So when it decides to go to war with Mexico, okay, but that doesn't stop me uh, from having a moral obligation to decide what I'm going to do about that. So we're dealing with moral duties, and courts need to understand that. Okay, thirdly, and very quickly, uh, what about this uh, question of uh, the, uh, uh, how does this relate to the rights uh, of, of freedoms uh, of other, other people? Well, in the paper I explain, uh, uh, yes, of course, I accept that, uh, but often it's not a straightforward uh, uh, calculation that has to be done because there are notions of indirect uh, harm uh, that frequently feature on, on the one side. It's not a straight question, for example, of, of I would say, of, of a harm that you know, directly affects gay people, often the categories of harm, I would say, are indirect and are more to do with offence rather than denial of service, uh, always. Uh, being the case. Secondly, of course, we can point to statutory uh, examples uh, where uh, the, uh, the rights of others are actually dealt with rather neatly uh, because the statutory test, if you take, for example, Section 4 of the Abortion Act, uh, focuses on the directness of your participation in the act that you find to be morally offensive. Uh, so the statute uh, tries to, uh, to deal uh, with, uh, with the question of harm in a way that bounces. But then thirdly, of course, inevitably, we come to this very difficult question about balancing and, and proportionality. And this is a bit of paper I can't describe in any, any uh, detail here. Uh, but just to say uh, that although I do think proportionality and balancing have had their place, uh, in the paper I, I try to explain 
of why often the issue does not correctly arise uh, because of what I call a reversibility uh, approach. And so uh, my approach, for example, uh, to uh, the Liddell case before the uh, European Court of Human Rights is actually to favour uh, the view of the minority uh, in, in that, uh, that case. In, in, um, and I would argue with them that there was no legitimate aim uh, that triggered uh, the, uh, the question of a right or freedom of someone else that had to be balanced in the first place. You have to see the paper uh, and, and read through what's rather a complicated argument, but I can uh, happy to deal with questions about that. John's giving me the look, so I think I'd better leave it uh, uh, there. Thanks very much. Thank you.